Hey, hello. <laughs> the hiccups have gone. Um, we're back in the original room, but I realised I took the Christmas decorations down to make my den the other day, and I haven't put them back up. So now this room just looks gross, doesn't it? Although at least I'm somewhat dispelling this myth that like all media elites are living in mansions with millions of pounds in our media bubbles. We actually just do live like disgusting tramps in in houses that are messy. Um, uh, how, how is everyone? Can you hear me okay? Um, uh, ow, just kicked a bin. Um, so fancy Wednesdays, I've gone for this glittery number today. Ooh, sparkle glitter and um <clears throat> and makeup too. Ow. Um happy so fancy Wednesday, everyone. Uh yeah, so I've had a look at the chapters. I reckon we're gonna do one chapter tonight because it's quite long. And also I've had quite a few messages over the last couple of days from people who are desperately trying to catch up. Um and it would be really nice to sort of um see if we can uh Use your words, Laura. I'm so, I, I was just been doing that upside down thing, trying to get rid of my hiccups and I've poured water all over the living room carpet and it's also a little bit up my nose. So I'm a bit flustered. Calm down. Okay. Um. Anyway, so I was thinking if we do one chapter tonight, uh, just because there's been quite a few people messaging and saying that they're trying to catch up. So it'd be really nice if we could slow down and then like maybe by the end, we've got as many people as possible all together for the last chapter. Um. So if that's all right it's quite a long chapter tonight anyway so and also I really worry about short changing you all but we don't have anything else to do so it doesn't really matter if we do longer sessions in a day or um or we have more days to do this does it um thanks Claire for saying I look beautiful um you're already oh it's already Thursday in New Zealand GP says yeah I well you can do so fancy Thursdays or you can be ahead of the curve and do them Wednesday in New Zealand <laughs> um this is one of my favorite dresses for gigging when I'm allowed to gig I like it because it's got these frilly bits here but also I have this joke about this bit here which it's not showing up that well on the webcam, but you know, it doesn't matter because I work out quite a lot, and quite strong, but this bit, there's nothing you can do about this bit. So this dress lets me have that covered up for most of the set. And then when I do that bit, I can get it out. Yay. Right. So, <laughs> um, right. Let's go then. So at the end of the last chapter, the God and the devil had agreed that they were going to, um, make the bet about religion. So Sarah and Hamish have to agree on religion by the end. We had the big reveal from Frank and Catherine. So we'll jump in for chapter 34. <clears throat> Hamish was stuck somewhere between relief and absolute turmoil. He tried to think calmly and organise his thoughts into useful columns. In his positive column, he found a growing pile of respect for Frank. While Hamish had no re religious affiliations himself, he did find it easier to sympathise with those... Yes, sorry, I was just checking I was on the right internet in case it starts breaking up, because even though our flat is a shoebox, we have to have two different internets because it goes around a corner and the age of the building confuses the beads in the air or whatever internet is. I don't know. Anyway, sorry, back to the story. While Hamish had no religious affiliations himself, he did find it easier to sympathise with those who did it wholeheartedly and avoided hypocrisy. In the negatives column, he found an image of himself sitting with Frank and adding to Frank's list of reasons why a relationship between an atheist and a Christian should and could never work properly. Sat firmly straddling the line in between these lists was the overwhelming desire to be with Sarah and to love her and make her happy until the day he died. He was surprised he wasn't cross-eyed. Frank, I can only apologise, Hamish began, but Frank interrupted him. Frank was an eternally practical man, and once a knot was put in front of him, he intended to unravel the knot, not try and find out who tied it. Let's put that irrelevancy to one side for the time being, said Frank. It's an unpleasant revelation, and one I have no desire to dwell on if it's not immediately useful to the current situation. Perhaps we should stick to the actual problem from now on. Hamish nodded thoughtfully, feeling a little ashamed of how he had wronged Frank. Why did you never say anything? asked Sarah. It wasn't our place, said Frank. Hamish is a good man and he makes you happy. 
if you want to marry him, then that's your choice. It's not the worst choice you could make, but we can't help the way we feel. Mum, Sarah questioned. Well, sorry, Sarah, but yes, I agree with your father. I just don't understand why it's not a bigger deal for you. Because it doesn't make him a bad person, said Sarah, but it doesn't make him a good Christian either, said Catherine. It was unenjoyable to be spoken about in the third person. Hamish sat still, growing increasingly concerned about his lack of ideas with which to interrupt. I don't know if I think a good Christian is any better than a very... I don't know if I think a good Christian is any better than a very good atheist, Sarah said thoughtfully. It's not about whether or not he's a good man, Frank interrupted. Frank interrupted where Hamish seemed unable. I don't understand how you can claim to share a life with someone who doesn't share your single most important belief. What unity can you have when you are divided on something that theoretically should be the basis for everything in the world? Footnote. This kind of question really fascinates me because my mum's religious and my dad isn't. And I just find that absolutely baffling that you could love someone and be married to someone that just fundamentally thinks all the building blocks of the world are different to the way you think they are. So I find this question really interesting. I, Sarah started but didn't know how to continue. Hamish wished she could form the words he was trying to mould. Hamish wished she could form the words he was trying to mould in his own mind. If she could just start, he was sure he could get there with the end of the sentence. What he wanted to do was ask out loud whether his and Sarah's opinions on things were so very different. They both wanted to be good. They both believed in truth and sustainability and the planet and not kicking things smaller than themselves. What did it matter if Sarah was doing it because of God and he was just doing it? He wondered if this was a valid point or whether he'd missed something fundamental about religious fervency that you couldn't understand unless you were a believer. Marriage isn't easy, said Catherine, surprising everyone. They turned to look at her to see where she was directing the conversation. There's so much compromise depending on how you're going to do the small things, let alone if you disagree on the major things. But we hardly ever argue, Sarah began. I'm not talking about rows, Catherine said gently. I mean just small everyday things that need to be decided between the two of you. It isn't easy. And what about having children? If you two can't decide as one on a religious path, how are you going to direct a child down it? Well, maybe we wouldn't raise our child religious, said Sarah, sounding increasingly confused and small. Would you be happy with that? What? Why should you not be able to share that with your child because Hamish doesn't believe it? Frank said. Hamish bristled. Maybe we'd let our child decide what they believed with, with both options readily available to them, said Sarah. That seems much fairer. They should know they have options. And what child is going to choose church on a Sunday morning over playing at home? asked Catherine. Jesus, who was trying to remain as invisible as possible in the conversation, made a mental note to try and remember this for later. Perhaps inflatable churches would help. I don't think a child has to go to church to grow up to be a good Christian. It, it can come later. And how is a child supposed to give themselves to Christ when doubt has been constantly sown into their mind by their own father? Asked Frank. Oh, here we go. I've got to get back into Scottish now after the other ones. <laughs> oh, God, what is wrong with a Scottish accent? Hey, eh? couldn't you have made it one that I could do, guys? Uh, um, um, right, OK, let's get Frank out. Let's wash Frank out. Bye, Frank. Hi, Sassenach. Um, I'm not being petulant. Nope. <laughs> it's like trying to do a run up for a vault or something. I know when I've just not stuck the. I'm like, I'm not going to make the landing. Um, I, I will. It's hard being Scottish. I'm not being petulant with my atheism. <laughs> Hamish finally spoke. And when it came, here it comes. Oh, I can see your comments. Blah. Oh, no, you're actually not. Okay, fine. Ugh, right, accent. Um, maybe we could get them doing. We could do it. Yeah, that's it, Sean, isn't it? It's so stereotypical and probably really offensive, but I do have to... Okay, that's Scottish, right? I spent all last evening talking to my Scottish brother-in-law on Zoom. I should know how to do this. <clears throat> 
I'm not being petulant with my atheism. Hamish finally spoke, and when it came, it was sharp, heavy, and directed swiftly at Frank. I've often felt passionately since meeting Sarah that I would have to love to have a faith. I would give anything to know I had eternity with Sarah, that it wasn't just the maximum 60-year offer that mortality bestows. Oh, oh, to be a believer, and know I had heaven with her. Well, that would create heaven on earth too. It's not a choice I have doggedly made and stuck to, despite huge evidence to the contrary. Several eyes glanced across to the motionless Jesus sitting to the left of Catherine. Up until now, obviously, I can't help not believing in God any more than you can help believing. A g- a be- no, right, now back into Frank. <laughs> A belief in God is something that has needed constant maintenance in my life, said Frank. It doesn't always come easily, and it has seemed, on several occasions, as though it would be easier to walk away. But when you work hard for something, it pays off. But I can't work hard for something that isn't there within me, Hamish insisted, desperate to make them see. It isn't laziness or a dislike of the regulations. The belief isn't there. I didn't believe in a God before this happened and I can't promise I'll believe in worshipping him, it, it, him, it, whatever, when, if the world go back to normal. How could you not? asked Catherine, genuinely incredulous. The son of God is sitting before you and you might still not worship him. I, well, I don't know how, said Hamish, trying to unravel his feelings as he went along. Maybe I would. I'm just saying I couldn't promise it. Have you not got along well with Jesus? asked Catherine. Jesus thought this was an extremely over-personal question to ask while he was sitting right there. He thought he'd bonded quite well with Hamish so far and he didn't want to suddenly have the rug pulled out from under him if it turned out Hamish had felt differently. I've got along brilliantly with Jesus, said Hamish, and nodded in a brotherly fashion towards a relieved looking Jesus. I'll certainly keep in touch. Hamish managed a wry smile. <clears throat> but that's got nothing to do with whether I'd even choose Christianity. Maybe I'd be a Jehovah. Catherine flinched. Frank scoffed and leaned back in his chair. I've forgotten how much I like Catherine as a character. She's quite fun. <laughs> She's quite fun to play anyway. Um, What I'm saying, Hamish continued, is that I think an organised religion has a lot tied up in it that's gone off track a little, in my opinion. Some of the things you think of as the building blocks of your faith are just nonsense to my way of life. Like what? asked Frank defensively. Frank, look at the way you just scoffed when I mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, the loonies, said Frank. Why? Because of the blood transfusion thing and the lack of birthdays? asked Hamish. Well. Yes, said Frank. That's how I feel about the Christian church's general opinion of women and gay people and sex. There are so many things that I think have become linked up in a personal belief in God that I just don't think are right. Knowing and meeting Jesus doesn't help me reconcile my thoughts to those. But, said Sarah, her first word in a while, but could you change that? Now that you know Jesus is real and and you don't dislike Jesus, couldn't you worship him? If something important rested on it, like us, for example. Hamish stopped. Trust Sarah to turn a different light on. Trust Sarah to be the only one to say anything remotely persuasive. Trust Sarah. He opened his mouth to tell her he'd do anything if it meant keeping her and loving her, but he didn't quite get the first syllable out before Jesus raised his hand and piped up. Oh, he began, shuffling forward in his canvas chair and trying to clench the life back into his increasingly numbing buttocks. Oh, I don't know if that's a particularly helpful route to go down. What do you mean? asked Hamish, perplexed. I think she could be right. I know you exist now. Why wouldn't that change things if I wanted it to? Or... Do I have to follow every single belief of the church down to the letter? Hamish glanced at the Gilmores and his heart sunk. That was asking too much. Hey, that's not for me to say. It's just that uh, I need to explain how things will be when I'm gone. When I leave, you won't necessarily be so certain that I exist. Jesus sighed and wondered how best to explain this part of the conundrum. 
Lots of people meet me day in, day out. I am met. But after the meeting, not everyone converts to Christianity. After I'm gone, you won't be able to place the memories of having met me in a physical sense. You may well feel like you have met me, but you might not. Hamish shook his head like a stunned post-wallop boxer. Are there criteria for this? I'm not sure I completely follow. Have you ever heard of someone saying they found God? Asked Jesus. Aye. Well, that's the best case scenario. Over the last 2,000 years, I have periodically appeared on earth and briefly presented myself to individuals, usually just for a few hours or minutes and given them the chance to speak with me. I pick people I feel passionately about for some reason. When someone says they have found God, it literally means they found me. The, the physical me. We met and had some kind of interaction, and after I'd gone, that person was left believing in me and my teachings. And by believing in me, I mean believing in what I asked for, not just believing I could be real. They wanted to believe. They, they had that desire. And so after I left them, they were able to hold on to that feeling. Of course, you've never heard of anyone saying, oh yeah, I jumped, bumped into Jesus in a field and we had a good chat. They're more likely to say they felt they had a spiritual awakening. They, they might remember a beautiful sunset that put a new feeling into their heart or, or an event that suddenly gave them faith. In some people, it starts small and then builds over time as their passion for it grows. But finding God in adult life will have started with some meeting with me that they now cannot quite remember. I don't allow for them to remember the hard evidence. It needs to be built on faith. It's all about faith. If you know, then it's knowledge. It has to be faith. Hey, you don't like to make things easy for yourself, do you? Hamish grumbled. Maybe that will happen to Hamish, asked Sarah hopefully. Woo, it's a possibility, Jesus worded carefully. But Frank is right when he says a religious belief is hard work, something that needs careful nurturing. You have to want to keep that belief to be able to. Otherwise, for a lot of people, they won't remember meeting me. At all, said Hamish. You, well, you might feel like you've been changed a little. You might feel you've had a bit of a spiritual awakening. But unless when I left you were full of belief in me, you, you won't hold on to that faith as a part of you. What will I think has happened? Well, no, where's that gone? <laughs> what will I think has happened? Happened? How did you happen? Oh, well, forget that word. It's the word happened. There you go. Will my memory have been wiped? Not exactly, no. You'll remember all the interaction with Sarah and everyone else, but you won't remember me. A lot of people come out of the other side of a meeting with me feeling much more spiritual, but not having a defined sense of it being Christian. And you think that's what I will feel like? I just think, based on the way you've been talking about feeling and the doubts that you have, despite being sat opposite me, we shouldn't count on you coming out the other side of this, being able to hold on to the concrete certain belief that I am your saviour and the centrepiece for your life. It has to be faith. Fair? I suppose so, said Hamish reluctantly under the watching eyes of the entire Gilmore family. Then we're back to square one, said Sarah. And they were. They settled down comfortably on that first square and sat there as 10,000 words passed between them. <clears throat> the conversation peaked and troughed in ever more repetitive circles. They continued talking long after it had become cold enough to necessitate them moving back into the living room. They discussed heaven, children, souls, eternal salvation and the fundamental difference between wanting to believe and knowing that you did until all eyelids drooped. Hamish felt more and more angry and despondent as the night wore on. It just shouldn't matter, he thought. None of this should matter. He felt outbatted, outnumbered, woefully ineloquent about the things he really wanted to say. What have I reminded myself of there? Is it Hamilton? Outgunned, outmanned, outbattered, outnumbered. Anyway, niche, sorry. Uh, woefully ineloquent about the things he really wanted to say. He didn't know what they were hoping to achieve and he didn't know how to aim them there, but he, he also knew that if the conversation ended, then so did his chance to be with Sarah. Now that everyone had been made so painstakingly aware that he couldn't rely on the existence of a heaven suite, he wanted to wring out every last minute of life on this planet. These were moments he did know existed.
Sarah was completely lost. She didn't want to change Hamish, but she didn't know how they were going to bring about any kind of conclusion to this nightmare conversation. She couldn't make her parents see that religion wasn't a factor in their relationship, and the more the non-existent minutes didn't tick by, the less she believed herself that these issues would not be increasingly real once time resumed plodding on. Perhaps her parents had been right all along. When had they been wrong before? Perhaps she'd been a fool to think she knew better concerning God and marriage. But when the alternative was losing Hamish, oh, and then she was all at sea again. Eventually they decided to sleep. Sarah and Hamish lay stiffly in the bed next to each other. The contents of their dissected relationship lay like a post-mortem at their feet, rendering physical contact unthinkable. Two specimens of a particularly interesting study who had who had to endure consciousness as the experiment took place and the men in white coats pushed at the tenderest nerve endings to look for signs of flinching. Sarah prayed for sleep to come while Hamish wished for it fervently. Eventually their separate pleas worked and they were granted sweet relief, but morning came all too soon. Frank and Catherine had risen long before Sarah and Hamish dressed awkwardly with their backs to one another and descended to meet them in the kitchen. They were barely five mouthfuls into a breakfast of porridge, oats and water before conversation resumed and Hamish felt his stool buckle beneath him as he was plunged back into this pool of confusion and dead ends. He didn't know if he wanted to be able to come up for air. The previous evening's rambling arguments surfaced and resurfaced across the conversation and as morning marched on into early afternoon, Jesus noticed that Hamish had stopped joining in. Jesus thought he looked dejected, like he was deflating slowly into the armchair. Frank and Sarah were deep in discussion of why marriage was important anyway. Of why marriage was important anyway, if people loved each other enough just between them. Catherine was nodding along at everything Frank said and Hamish... Hamish was staring out of the window into the lovely weather in the garden full of flowers. Well, perhaps we should have some lunch and move out into the garden, Jesus said. Sarah and Frank didn't look up from their discussion, too busy dissecting what religion must mean to listen to what Jesus was actually saying. Too busy dissecting what religion must mean to listen to what Jesus was actually saying. Jesus cleared his throat and repeated what he had said. I sounds like a good idea, said Hamish, and abruptly stood up and headed up the stairs to the bathroom. What? Sarah looked up, confused. Lunch, said Jesus brightly, and then I thought we could move out to the garden. Lovely. Sarah pasted a smile over her face. She had that startled air of someone just woken from deep sleep. Jesus was impressed with how earnestly she had been involved in the conversation. Catherine and Sarah made lunch while Frank and Jesus discussed fishing. Jesus was largely winging the conversation, but it was really very pleasant to be discussing a different topic. They slurped their soups and enjoyed the respite. When they had finished, Hamish cleared away the bowls and headed to the door of the living room. Back in a minute. Oh, no, Scottish. Hmm. Back in a minute, he said. No, that was Irish. Smiling warmly at Sarah. Popping upstairs. <laughs> It's just some words, I just can't do them. Okay, she replied, smiling back. She felt good, inexplicably positive. They sat, enjoying a silence between themselves for a little while, each gazing in a nondescript direction and allowing their thoughts to float lightly. After a bit, Sarah got up and made them each a cup of tea. She dug some questionable biscuits out of a forgotten tin in a cupboard and put a plate of them on the table. She sat with her tea in her hand, enjoying the warmness of it and the satisfaction that each cup brought now that it wasn't a simple matter of flicking on a kettle for the water. Her eyes landed on Hamish's undrunk from mug on the coffee table. Oh, she said. She leant forward and put her mug down next to it. Oh, Hamish, he must be having a nap. I'll pop up and get him before this goes cold or he'll be cross he's missed it. No microwave rescues nowadays. Catherine wrinkled her nose at the thought of microwave tea. I'll go and fetch him, said Sarah, and padded out of the room towards the stairs. End of chapter 34. <sighs> oh no! Ah, uh, yeah, there we go, it's chapter 34. Discussions are underway. Um, so we'll come back for chapter 35 tomorrow. Thank you very much, gang. Um, oh, I'm going to have to do something about this room. It just looks desperately sad and gross, doesn't it? I'm going to sort this out ready for tomorrow. Um, sleep tight, everyone. Have a lovely day in New Zealand. I hope you're all safe and well around the world. And um, yeah, see you tomorrow. Bye.